Good evening. I'm Paul Engel. The stage I am now standing on once saw the superb talents of Sarah Bernhardt, Al Jolson, Eddie Foy and the seven little Foys, comedians such as W.C. Fields, Jack Benny, and Georgie Jessel, to name a few. Great talents in a great theater. They are all now but memories pressed between the pages of time and the history of this theater in Dubuque, Iowa. Dubuque was the first major city in Iowa to bring theatrical entertainment to a new frontier in 1838. And the rapid growth of theaters flourished in the late 1800s. At one time, Dubuque would boast of 21 legitimate theaters. Over the years, it would host 128 local theatrical companies. But in the early 1930s, live theater gave way to a new invention, the motion picture. Live theater dimly faded with the flicker of the projector that replaced it. The superlative match for a society's thirst for entertainment. However, the excitement of a live performance can never be truly duplicated by any other form of media. Changing times bring about reform both in entertainment and theater. This theater is a major part of Dubuque's Renaissance. This magnificent theater was originally christened in 1910, The Majestic. It was designed by C.W. and George L. Rapp, who later became this country's leading theater designers in the 1920s. Acoustically, probably the best in the Midwest. The decorative architecture is awe-inspiring. In 1970, its splendor was almost lost to a wrecking ball by a downtown urban renewal project. It was only at the 11th hour that a handful of concerned local citizens was able to save this theater by proposing to convert it to a part of a civic center. Six years later, the old theater is ready to play host to Dubuque's 1976 bicentennial original musical entitled Get the Lead Out. A gentleman who can tell us more about the past of this historical landmark and also about the bicentennial play is the writer and director of Get the Lead Out, Mr. Charles Giroux. You are the person who seems to know more about the history of theater in Dubuque than anyone else. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> uh, it came to pass that uh, uh, I needed a dissertation topic as I was doing my work uh, in the theater at Wayne State in Detroit. In Dubuque, uh, I uh, lived here and, uh, and taught before here, and uh, I began some preliminary research, and it, uh, it uncovered a whole very full, exciting tradition of theater in, uh, in Dubuque from 1837 till today. So you, you had 140 years of theater, and that must have come as a surprise. You had no idea how much there had been. Not at all. Uh, I was certain the Orpheum had something to offer, or the Majestic, as it was called, uh, and the Grand Opera House, which is at 8th Street further down. Um, as two existing buildings, and I was pretty satisfied that that's what it would be. But as it turned out, uh, I didn't even get to this theater. Uh, I had to stop at 1877, uh, and we discovered 13 separately owned and operated theaters in, uh, in the 40 years from 37 to 77. Uh, you know, I haven't seen the production. Can you tell us a little about... Uh 
you know, yes. is, <clears throat> give us a small summary of what actually happens. Uh, it's, it's rather uh, uh, intertwined. There are uh, six separate uh, incidents or events that, that occur, and each one of them is linked uh, uh, to each of the others. But the main overall uh, concern as the play opens is a Supreme Court decision concerning uh, legal uh, uh, or validity of the title in, uh, claims. Uh, uh, it seems Julian Dubuque sold some of the land to a fellow in St. Louis, Pierre Chouteau. Uh, and in the 1850s, Chouteau came to make his claim good to the land. Uh, and the issue went through all the courts up to the Supreme Court. So the play opens near the end of that Supreme Court situation, and they're uh, tensely waiting to find uh, the outcome of, uh, of the Supreme Court decision. That's the overall uh, plot. Then in the midst of that is a uh, 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 disturbance in the domestic tranquility as the Irish citizens and the German citizens uh, uh, have a kind of natural ethnic animosity and it uh, is uh, aggravated by this Supreme Court decision because the, uh, uh, the Germans are reluctant to join a petition drive uh, and the Irish are for it and there's a um, uh, conflict there. Then in addition to that and kind of as a little subplot to that we have the love interest between, that. between uh, uh, Gretchen, who is the daughter of the German leader, and Karmic, who is the uh, son of the Irish leader. If it sounds a little uh, Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> you're, uh, you're in the ballpark. You have a scene in the two. Uh, no. <laughs> no, we, we, uh, well, we'll talk about the scenes later. Then enters the villain, uh, titled uh, J. Clifton Perdue. Uh, not really, as we mentioned earlier, not an authentic uh, uh, personality, but a composite of, uh, of several others. Uh, and he comes from St. Louis, and he's read of the land claim uh, trouble in Dubuque, and comes with a, a scheme to sell fraudulent title insurance, uh, which uh, uh, suits his character perfectly. Then also on that same steamboat arrives uh, uh, Madame Rienza, and her female minstrels, as they were called then. They're really um, essentially can-can dancers, but the female minstrels was um, the, the uh, billboard title for them then. And uh, she causes uh, a disruption in the, uh, the moral um, the stability of the community, and uh, Mrs. Adams and Reverend Alan Kerr of the Literary Society uh, uh, do battle against uh, the moral degeneracy brought on by the madam and her can-can dancers. And finally, Mrs. Adams, uh, uh, who has encouraged uh, Mr. Perdue, who's from the outside, from St. Louis, to talk to the Literary Society about uh, thing, the scene in St. Louis and, and, uh, and other things, uh, Mrs. Adams recognizes a... Uh, uh, a um, uh, a likeness between Mr. Perdue and her estranged husband from Cincinnati. Uh, and those are the, uh, the six uh, areas of uh, conflict in, in the play. And each of those, uh, with the exception of, as I say, the character of Perdue, each is taken from incidents that I discovered doing the research for the, for the history of the theater. Now, in this production, you um have established uh, dances. Are they of the period too? Uh, well, the, uh, uh, as we had our production meetings in, in the uh, early stages, the question was, uh, do we do it absolutely authentically or do we stylize it and adapt it? And uh, the decision is to, to do it in the best possible musical comedy tradition. Uh, maintaining a flavor rather than the the uh, authenticity. Come and show you what 
next to me is the composer, musical director, and conductor of Get the Lead Out, Paul Hemmer. Uh, Paul, I'm going to ask you uh, some questions in simple prose, and I would expect you to <laughs> sing your answers. Wouldn't be fair to try, I suppose. <laughs> First of all, you are a, a truly local Dubuque boy. If you We'll forgive the word boy. Right. Well, I, I still feel like a kid, basically. I'm always a boy at heart, I guess. <laughs> yes, I was born and raised in Dubuque. In fact, I remember sitting in this very box we're sitting in watching uh, Saturday afternoon cereals throwing popcorn at the kids below very frequently. It was a, a fun thing. This theater is But not for so the exciting. people down below who well, no, the popcorn. Well, no, but they'd probably throw them back anyway, so it, was, <laughs> it balanced out. Did you uh, study music in Dubuque? No, I didn't. I went to an uh, excellent uh, university just north of Dubuque, Platteville, Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin at Platteville, and studied uh, four years there and then went on for another year of master's work. I never did finish it. One of these days, maybe I'll get around to that. How did you happen to get involved with uh, Get the Lead Out? Did you know uh, Charles Giroux before? No, I really didn't. I can remember seeing some of Chuck's productions when he was up at Clark when I was still in high school, actually. And uh, Wayne Norman, who was really the man who saved the, the five flags, uh, got together with Chuck one day when they were talking about developing something for the bicentennial. And they stopped down to see me at the radio station where I work and asked me if I'd be interested because they knew I had been playing around with music long enough and maybe would be interested in writing. So and were you interested in the past of Dubuque? Uh, this, this takes place 125 years ago. I'm a ago. history buff, yeah. I'm very interested in Dubuque's past. And uh, it made it, uh, they made a, an interesting offer, you know, this collaboration with a fellow who I, I could remember from my past and doing the Dubuque thing. It was very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Yes. Were there problems in your collaboration? The biggest problem was our distance. Of course, Chuck being in Michigan and me being in Dubuque, we did run up some horrendous telephone bills, long distance wise. Well, of course, but those will all be earned back by the great success of the well, production. Well, we hope. <laughs> and we did manage to get together one wonderful weekend in Chicago when things really finally came together back in November, which was, well, I had only spent two days in person with him prior to that. The rest was all long distance. Amazing. So. <laughs> I don't know how it can be done. Uh, did you uh, ever uh, ask for changes in his text to, to suit your music better? Uh, we, yeah, we balanced back and forth pretty much. Uh, Chuck would give me suggestions on uh, lyric changes, and if I didn't like the way something was developing in the plot, I'd uh, 
bat that back. Did in. you write the words for the songs as well as the music? Basically all of the lyric. There's a couple of tunes that I have to give full credit to Chuck for lyric on the Cincinnati Secret, which is a melodrama type tune, is his. Uh, did it surprise you that there was so much talent within the Dubuque area? Not really, because I've been a follower of theater in Dubuque and been involved in variety shows and vaudeville shows for a number of years here. And uh, pretty much knew that there was a lot of good talent available. So that didn't worry me at all. And of course, I think it's a marvelous thing for a city to have its own musical show and to have the music composed by a native son. Uh, do you have a feeling that people treat you with a little more respect now that uh, you've done <laughs> the music for their show? Well, we'll wait until after they see it. Maybe, you know, it will be time for me to change jobs after that's over. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have a favorite song in the show? Well, I kind of like them all, really, I suppose. But if there's a favorite one, the song that could be taken out of the show and still have some meaning and uh, say something for today or any generation, it's Can I Ever Be Me. production has a producer who handles the administrative problems and creates a working atmosphere for actors and directors. The charming lady seated next to me is Mrs. Dorothy Gibbs, producer for Get the Lead Out. Now Get the Lead Out is a local show. You're a local person. You were born in Dickeyville, Wisconsin, only 10 miles away. Uh, you went to school in Dubuque? Yes, I did. I went to high school at uh, Immaculate Conception Academy in Dubuque, and I uh, am a graduate of Clark College in Dubuque. And were you always a producer, or did you become a producer later on after you left college? Were you always in the theater? Uh, I was until uh, the past six years or so, and I think uh, that my specialty was directing. I've done most of that, but I have done a quite a bit of production work. I worked, I did production work for Army Special Services, and uh, I uh, did production work at Clark College here in Dubuque. I did return to Clark later, and uh, I taught there at the same time that uh, 
Charlie Giroux taught. Now, as producer, are you interested in getting any special groups uh, to come and see your production? Absolutely. That's uh, probably been one of my major goals as producer is to make the people of the state of Iowa and in particular the, uh, the people of Dubuque and the surrounding areas feel, feel at home in this magnificent, magnificent theater. Well, now this theater was able to be redecorated through private gifts uh, by residents of Dubuque, is that that's, right? That's correct. Uh, and uh, the same group that restored the theater, of course, uh, the, fi the Five Flags uh, uh, committee that spearheaded the drive to uh, get the contributions necessary to restore the theater uh, are also uh, the executive, the co-executive producer of Get the Let Out. And I want to share uh, this interview with them, I think. Uh, the, the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce and the Five Flags uh, executive committee provided the seed money that enabled us to go ahead and finance uh, this production. The youth of Dubuque is no doubt very fortunate. First of all, <clears throat> the city has a recreation department which views recreation not only as uh, having sports, uh, not against sports. I participated all my life and uh, I still uh, swim and play tennis. I'm in, totally in favor of sports. but. To have recreation also mean uh, the barn with its art and its uh, music and stage, and to have recreation also mean uh, a theater like this, is to mean that the, the city of Butte recognizes that the arts are the joy of life and the health of life. Also, uh, to have businessmen who will contribute to the arts and to a production like this means a very high level of enlightenment. Not, not only that, but it's, I, I see it also as an act of great courage on, that, on their part because theater is, uh, has not traditionally been a great uh, money maker. Yeah, they took a risky venture, and I, I think we're going to be able to return to them their investment. Uh, I'm confident of that. Well, they then but in nonetheless, turn will it, return it to you for another <laughs> production, and it'll go on and on. Oh, well, I should hope so. I'm not sure that's going to happen. That's what we're hoping, of course, uh, and we're very determined for that reason to be uh, financially uh, responsible as a company working here. But uh, I, think it's I think it's a courageous thing. Uh, well, look, I think you have do. a lot of courage, too. Uh, um, I congratulate you on it, and uh, Dorothy Gibbs, thank you very much for coming and telling us about all of your hopes and none of your troubles. I gotta get out and get away from my away. I can't believe you do the things you do. Get up every morning with the chickens. In St. Louis, I could sleep at least till noon. I gotta get out and get away from my away. The name itself is poison in my throat. In St. Louis, all the ladies look so pretty. In Dubuque, I'd rather kiss a nanny goat. Dirty streets and yards full of animals. Fighting Irish, stubborn Germans too. No culture, no class. But lots of corn and pigs, P.U. I gotta get out and get away from my away. And if you're smart, I'll tell you what to do. You gotta get out and see exactly what the world's about. You gotta get out and get away from my away, too. Away from my away. Time has come to cut the ties that bind. Living in the Duke is really boring. In another week or two, I'll lose my mind. We gotta get out and get away from my way. My land has got to grow and spread its wings. Romance and adventure must be waiting. the best of them. Nothing scares me, cause I am a man. And ladies, look out, just catch me if you can. 
We gotta get out and get away from my way. We thought it through and now know what to do. We gotta get out and see exactly what the world's about. We gotta get out and get away from my way too. In this two-part series, we've seen how a city incorporated its architectural heritage to coincide with the present-day mode of living. And we've seen how community spirit has updated a theatrical landmark. What is your community doing to enhance your cultural perspective? And do you support or become involved in their efforts? It just may be worth your while to investigate the various programs in your area. We hope you will give it some thought. I'm Paul Engel. Good evening.